This morning, we have the pleasure of introducing our next keynote speaker, Paula Marquez. Nous avons eu la chance de travailler avec Paula cet été pendant sa participation en tant que partenaire global pour Go Project euh, au mois de juillet à Toronto. Paula is a passionate activist and educator about Colombia. She is also the first openly gay person to work in the Colombian church. Pendant pendant notre mois de travail ensemble, nous avons tellement appris à propos de la culture, de l'histoire et de la structure sociale en Colombie. So working at the Go Project over the summer, we learned some fun facts about Paula, and one of them is that she can catch anything between her teeth, or not her teeth, oh her feet, her feet. So, <laughs> so don't be like throwing stuff at her during her speech, but maybe like when she's done throughout the weekend, you can just toss something and she'll catch it between her feet. It's amazing. So. <laughs> Oh yes, that's also still me. Um, so we also learned that Paula is one of the most wise and thoughtful people um, in that I've ever met. So we're very excited to hear her speech. Um, it's going to be lit. Buckle up. Um, so accueillez, accueillez chaleureusement Paula Marquez. <laughs> All right. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, there won't be any French from me. I can barely do English. So there's that. All right. So let's start. Uh, I'm from Colombia. Shout out to Colombia. Where's Athena? Athena, yes. Well, she went to Colombia. Um, so first, I. I want to say that I'm from the Colombian Methodist Church. Uh, we have been global partners uh, for 15 years of the United Church of Canada. And anyone know what's, what a Methodist is? Oh, that's cool, great. Uh, so we like to think of ourselves as Colombian Methodists. And we practice social goals, gospel. Uh, we are in love with John Wesley. and. But what we practice and we try to practice every day is um, social holiness, which means that my holiness depends on my relationship to God and with people. So I cannot only say, oh, I love God, but then my brothers and sisters are dying of hunger. So just for you to keep in mind. Um, uh, also, little disclaimer, I have been here in Canada for two months, um, so, you know, I have learned a lot about Canada, I've been in Toronto, uh, Vancouver, and now Montreal, um, so I initially, I was only going to be here for rendezvous, but then Jim Hobson and people from the general office started to add more staff to it. Well, now that you're going to be in Montreal, just go to the conference for LGBT rights and be a panelist there. And they continue to add that and I am that going to Vancouver and then end up adding another month. I went for, uh, to work for the GO project. Uh, I learned a lot of the GO project. Words like buckle up, giddy up. Um, so my English is in another level. <laughs> um, okay, so now um, let's get to the serious stuff. We're gonna get real here. So, Colombia. Um, there's a, it is said in Colombia, I, I do, that after God finished the creation of the earth and he was going to rest on the seventh day, he found this place that he created between two seas full of emeralds, springs, and the best coffee ever. <laughs> and he decided that, he, that that place was where he was going to rest. And he took a siesta. <laughs> I come from that place, from Colombia. Um, Colombia is a, an array of dramatically contrasting landscapes just all over the country. There's a fa famous ad advertisement from a French company that says, if you want to see the Pacific, you can go to Peru. If you want to see the Andes, you can go to Chile. 
If you want to see the Caribbean, you can go to the Dominican Republic or Cuba. And if you want to see the Amazon, you could go to Brazil. But if you want to see all of it together, you could go to Colombia. <laughs> Colombia is the country with the second highest bio biodiversity in the world behind Brazil. And as of 2016, 56,343 species are registered in Colombia. The country occupies the first position worldwide in number of orchids, second position in plants, amphibians, butterflies, and freshwater fish. Third place in species of palm trees. Yes, if you need to know that. <laughs> um, globally holds the fourth position in biodiversity of mammals. So cool, Columbia is a great place so far. Um, recently, a dear American friend confessed to me her amazement at the situation of Colombia. She said, I do not understand. With the country you have, with the talent of its people, why Colombia is so cornered by the social crisis? Why is there a situation of violence so dramatic? Why there is so much injustice, so much iniquity, so much impunity? What is the cause of all of that? And for a moment, I tried to answer but so many things crowded in, into me that I did not even know how to begin. I felt that even though I spoke without interruption all night, I would not be able to share with her all the explanations that I continue to give myself. Trying to understand the complex country that I belong to. And it is that Colombia had an internal conflict for 60 years that ended weeks ago. Uh, in that conflict, we had six, six million victims of forced displacement, 220,000 dead, dead people, more than 25,000 missing, and nearly 30,000 kidnapped. The story of Colombia, I believe, is, this, is, it, is the story of a prolonged postponement of the only adventure worth living the one for which Colombians truly take possession of our territory. We are aware of our nature, one of the most beautiful and privileged in the world. We become aware of our magnificent complexity of our ethnic and cultural composition. We're the most mixed country in Latin America between indigenous, Spanish, and African. And we commit ourselves to be a country and not a bunch of exclusions and conflict where a few privilege deeply embarrassed of the country from which they, gave their, they get their money, their wealth, that continue to preach day and night a mean speech of hate for the people they never knew how to honor, who always saw Colombia as a country of Indians, barbaric and ugly. The Colombian government, the Colombian state, excluded the, the poor people. And we have seen a colossal growth in the material and moral misery in the country. When the state, the government, tries to do something for the benefit of the poor, it does it like it's charity in a superficial way. Because the poor are not represented in the state, and the state seeks to mitigate the poverty, but it's not committed with real solutions for that population. And the poor people, they're not just an important minority, According to figures, half of the national population in Colombia lives in poverty. And I wonder, on which basis does the government not make its first priority the problem of poverty, through which the whole society has rushed into chaos? Or this gigantic mass of exiled, excluded human beings that have been forced to delinquency? Today, the main source of, source of crimes in Colombian society is common crime. Not guerrilla delinquency or drug crime, but common crime. Result of the ignorance, resentment, poverty, subhuman conditions of life, and of course, strengthened and perpetuated by impunity. It is shocking to think that while in every democratic country, the right to claim, to indignation, to resistance to oppression, are pillars of social life. In Colombia, all 
popular outrage is the cause of ferocious persecutions. A country unable to face its evils deserves their prostration and suffering. I disagree. I wonder where those people who protested, those people who rebelled, those who demanded, those who thought they had the right to claim a fairer, more respectful country, and that thinking, that thought becomes dark. The heroes are in the cemetery, a, a boy says to my ear. And I, I remember a play in which a character exclaims, miserable, the country that has no heroes. But we respond, no, miserable, the country that needs them. Colombia has, already, has had already many heroes. But the sad thing is that we continue to need them because the injustice is evident, as is evident the monstrous contrast between those who have a lot and those who have nothing, and being evident the corruption and the crime. Now, the Colombian elites decided to resolve one of the biggest issues of Colombia, the conflict, through a peace agreement, a word that, have became, that became for the country a source of social and moral degradation. And they decided to fix this, not because they care about the country, but because they realized that that was necessary to continue the ruling over the country. However, I, I believe it's our duty as Colombians to believe in that peace and try hard for it to work, to force the government to see beyond those agreements that they are not valid for what they represent to the government or the guerrillas, but they're valid because of what we, the humble people, can, can get out of them. We, the humble country that has suffered decades of violence, that have lost their children and parents in the war, that has seen its hope die, but it's, that's the only way that we can obtain the peace because we are the ones who really need it. And I dare myself to think about a better Colombia with a magnificent and encouraging future. And to say it out loud, it's really hard to be, I, I don't believe it myself sometimes. It sounds like an illusion. It sounds like I'm mocking myself. But then I, I see reasons to trust in Colombia. I think we are one of those countries filled with vitality. We are a rebellious country, unsubmissive, abundant in powerful individualities, rich in natural resources, rich in, in ethnicities, languages, and cultures, where day-to-day -day Colombian wake up to sunrise to make a better future for the, their children and families. And that's what I feel so proud to be part of the Columbia Methodist Church, a church with uh, which membership are Afro-Colombians, displaced, women, indigenous, and those ignored and abandoned by the Colombian society. A church that has decided to be prophetic, prophetic, to denounce injustice and preach the good news of salvation. In a country where doing that is reason to be killed. Has decided to be ecumenical, to work with other religious denominations and institutions in a country where, where other Christians decided that they were the chosen ones and turned their backs on people. That decided to be inclusive. So people like me, poor and gay, Super gay. Yeah. <laughs> frowned upon by my heritage, could be here living this summer dream. I dare to think that when my American friend asked me, so is it like, I don't know, like dangerous like to go to Colombia? <laughs> I don't have to think of a sarcastic answer uh, and think, well, do not worry. In Colombia, the only people in risk are other Colombians. I don't wanna think that anymore. And I dare to think to dream of, of a country where a little 14-year-old did not have to go to work because her family could not support her. And she still doesn't know what the future will bring. And I'm here asking you guys to bear with me. 
to be challenged to continue to have this amazing church that you have, but to want more. To continue to support more churches around the world who are the, leader, the little brothers and sisters. I still remember meeting Gary Patterson four years ago. Yeah, go Gary. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's gay, he's amazing. I'm gay, I can be amazing. <laughs> And since that time, I have decided to be Gary for other people. And how also could, could it be that you could do that too? So here is, continue to help your global partners, try to understand the struggle of other countries and your own privilege. Learn another language, travel, help build bridges and help others to dare to dream. Thank you. Don't go anywhere, friends. We're going to do a little bit of Q&A, and then we're going to transition to workshops after that. So we have about, like, let's say 10 minutes to take questions. So we're going to have the roving microphones again, like we had yesterday. So if you haven't, we're going to raise the house lights. Look at that. OK, so if you have a question for Paola, about anything that she talked about or about Colombia, right? Are you open to answering any questions? Anything off limits? No. <laughs> okay, so raise your hand if you have a question and someone will find you. So first of all, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. It was amazing. So one of the... Uh, uh, stereotypes of Colombia is around uh, the drug culture, and it's almost uh, celebrated uh, to a point uh, where you know there's TV shows, and it's it constantly uh, out there as a stereotype and as a negative. To combat that, what are the great things about Colombia that if we if we were to name the top three things that you would want us to think about Colombia before the the negative, what would they be? Well, um, well, thank you. I would love to brag about Colombia. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'll say it in order. First, we're such a diverse country, not only in, in ge geography, but it's people as well. We are, we have 80% of our population is just mixed, mestiza, between Spanish, Africans, and indigenous. So we live those three, those three cultures every day. Um, this, of course, bring us to, brings us to Colombians are happy. Despite all the bad stuff that we have gone through, we continue to dance, we continue to enjoy every day and to seize life because we know that life is so, uh, might be so short. Um, and that takes me to the people. 
people that continue to strive every day to make it despite making average Colombia makes four dollars a day and poor Colombians made two dollars a day so despite that we continue to strive continue to really work hard to make a living for our families and children All, all the way up here. <laughs> um, so this is like a very open Christian community, right? Yeah. So in some parts of the world, they're like the really closed off Christian communities that think that even like gays and lesbians or bisexuals are a sin and they shouldn't even exist. How did you overcome those people in Colombia? I haven't done that. Oh. <laughs> Um, so our church uh, decided to be inclusive in 1992. We, did, we don't know what that means. Uh, my bishop, uh, who's been a partner of the United Church of Canada for those 15 years, he, he was the one who helped me to come out. And he's a progressive man. Our church continues to be polarized. Um, we haven't, you know, make a decision on full inclusiveness, inclusiveness, but our country, uh, it is very conservative, very anti-gay, homophobic country. So we are striving to be a better church and striving to be a church that can lead by example, but we haven't overcome that yet. Um, I have a question. You know how you said that people make four or two dollars mm -hmm. from work? How is there a way that you could help them out from over here? Like, because we're in Canada, is there a way that you could help out, like in Canada, to help people in Colombia get better lives? Well, thank you. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but the United Church of Canada. Uh, supports uh, cafeterias back in Colombia, supports different ministers in Colombia. So the way that you could help would be to promote uh, supporting the mission and, fu and, mission and service. service fund. Thank you. <laughs> and we could help more cafeterias and more people to have access to the basics. You support also a small clinic that we have in a place called uh, Brisas del Mar, which is a very uh, humble place. Uh, so if you continue to support, we continue to we can continue to help more people. And just to follow up on that, for years within the United Church of Canada, we've been supporting global partners like yours and have heard about Colombia and we would do what we can to promote that. But you keep getting that same question. Oh, we have to look after ourselves first. And so often it stops there. We have to look after our own. Any words of wisdom to us and to how to encourage people to see the bigger picture? God, that's, that's so hard. I, I have been in the middle of tons of churches here, from East Linton, uh, to First United and St. Andrews Wellesley. So I have seen uh, a lot of churches and I know that these people work really hard uh, to support their own local church and to support, you know, globally. I, what I would say is when we understand our own privilege and we understand all the opportunities that we have here, then we can start to understand what's going on around the globe. So being aware and finding you know, uh, a responsibility in your privilege. It's a way that you be, will, be able to, will be able to support other communities. Was that the last one? Okay. Thank you for your uh, great words. Um, that's very inspiring. I think your story already uh, is huge for many um, young people struggling with adversity in whatever way. Um, following up on Tanaka's earlier comment, um, I have a young trans friend who is Colombian, um, living in Canada, um, but she really, er, he still struggles with um, coming out to his family, his Colombian family, 
um, and dealing with that culture and some of the more tra uh, traditional and conservative aspects of it. I wondered what advice you would give to some of these young um, folks struggling with that aspect of their cultures. Well, um, I myself, when I came out, both of my parents are ministers. Uh, so my mom, just for you to, to know, condemned me to, condemned me to hell because that's what you do. Um, I, at, at the time, I decided to, to go to Medellin to a different city and I found a safe place there. And that was, it was Bishop, it was people from the congregation and then Bishop introduced me to Jim Hobson and to tons of other gay people and I finally accepted myself. So my recommendation for whoever who struggles with coming out or something like that is to find a safe place where you can be yourself and just try to do that. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering if you had feel like you could comment about um, any similar uh, experiences of uh, churches and communities in some of the neighboring countries like Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela. Do you have contact with those? Do you have support from those uh, and, and uh, mutual interests with those uh, groups in those countries? Well, we, we are like brothers, the, the three countries that you mentioned, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. Um, and we do have close relationships. Um, but if you're asking if the churches have connection, I'll say we barely do. Uh, we are the three churches, the Methodist churches at least, uh, in those three countries, we're, they're poor, maybe not the Equatorian church that much, but we f are focused locally in our own work. So we do connect when there's a huge event, but that hardly ever happens. Thank you so much, Paula.